Human greenhouse gas emissions have already caused one degree Celsius or two degrees Fahrenheit of global warming, and we're on track to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius or three degrees Fahrenheit by 2030. In order to curb our greenhouse gas emissions, we have to understand three things. Number one, what are we emitting and how much of it? Number two, what are the sources of those emissions? And number three, what are the underlying drivers of emissions? So number one, what are we emitting and how much? Greenhouse gas emissions include many different gases such as carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, chlorofluorocarbons and others. But CO2 makes up by far the largest share of the total. In 2019, CO2 emissions reached 38 gigaton CO2, a staggering weight, and that's just CO2. If we count all greenhouse gases, 2019 total emissions reached 52.4 gigatons of CO2 warming equivalent, which is abbreviated GTCO2e. Emissions reached record highs in 2019, but it's important to understand that the warming effects from greenhouse gases do not depend on how much we release in any given year, or even how much we've released over the last five years, because CO2 remains in the atmosphere for hundreds, if not over a thousand years. So we're living with the cumulative effects of the greenhouse gases we have released since the Industrial Revolution. And that total is a staggering 1.5 trillion tons of CO2. And despite the urgent need for rapid decarbonization, the amount of greenhouse gases that we release each year is only growing and growing very, very quickly. We can look at this skyrocketing number through a couple of different lenses. Number one, by country. It's clear that the vast majority of emissions come from just a few countries. The top four emitters, United States of America, EU plus the UK, China and India, have contributed about 55% of total emissions over the last decade. If you expand that group to the G20 members, you get to about 78%. But the largest recent emitters are not the same as the countries that have emitted the most in total. The US and the EU have contributed just under 50%, or 25%, 22% respectively, of cumulative global emissions. China has contributed 12.7%, and India falls to sixth place on this list, behind, again, the US, the EU, China, Russia, and Japan. We can also rank total emissions by economic sector to understand which activities are driving the problem. Doing so makes clear that there will never be a single solution to decarbonizing the economy because the use of fossil fuels and sources of emissions within each sector are so diverse. This chart from Our World in Data breaks down the sources of greenhouse gas emissions from 2016 across economic sectors. You can see that about 73% of total emissions come from the energy sector. This is energy use in homes, buildings, transportation, and industry. 18% comes from agriculture, forestry, and land use, with the largest share within that bucket coming from livestock and manure. Looking at the breakdown within these broad categories, we see that many different activities contribute to each sector's total emissions. For example, emissions within the energy sector are split across industry, transport, and buildings each of which will require very different approaches to decarbonize. We know, for example, that focusing on electrification of road transportation should be a priority because road transport accounts for about 12% of total emissions. But to construct projections about the future, we have to understand what drives these economic activities in the first place and what factors influence how emissions heavy they actually are. So what underlying factors drive human emissions? We can look at some key indicators of human activity. GDP per capita, population, energy intensity, or the economy, or how much energy is required to produce one unit of GDP. And carbon intensity, which is how much carbon is released to produce one unit of energy in that economy. Looking at global trends, we see that most of our emissions since the 1970s have been driven by two of these factors, namely population growth and GDP per capita. The things that people need for basic survival, like food and shelter, each have CO2 emissions associated with their production, processing, transport, and so on. 
The growth in population over time has contributed to the growth in CO2 emissions. But people don't just consume for basic survival. We also consume to maintain a particular lifestyle, whether that's through air conditioning, fancy cars, 65-inch TV screens, or G5 jets. As countries get richer and more developed, their lifestyle-based consumption increases, and with it, CO2 emissions. For example, although China releases about twice the emissions of the United States, the average emissions of an American citizen is about twice that of an average Chinese citizen. Now, global population and GDP per capita are both projected to increase through the end of the century. Does this commit us to a path of increasing CO2 emissions just when drastic cuts are most needed? Not necessarily. The other two indicators, energy intensity and carbon intensity, are the key. Energy intensity is the ratio of primary energy supply to GDP. That is, how much energy is required to produce one unit of GDP. And it is a measure of energy efficiency within a given economy. On a global scale, energy intensity has decreased over time as a result of technology, fiscal incentives and regulations that have encouraged or enabled improved energy efficiency. Carbon intensity is the final and critical factor. Carbon intensity is the amount of CO2 that is released to produce one unit of energy consumed. Reducing the carbon intensity in our energy systems, or in other words, our reliance on fossil fuels, is the most direct way to curb emissions. For example, France, which has the greatest reliance on nuclear energy compared to other EU countries, has decoupled growth in GDP per capita from CO2 emissions because nuclear fuel does not produce greenhouse gas emissions. It's possible, but requires the right enabling factors. In future episodes, we'll look at what policies countries can implement to accelerate the development of a low-carbon energy system, and what technologies may be critical to aid in the transition to a zero-carbon future. We'll also look at what commitments countries have made to reduce their emissions, and what and how they are doing as they work toward those goals.